All right. So let's get started on uh, lecture number 18. This lecture will uh, continue our discussion of um, drugs of use and abuse. The second half of the term, we'll get into talking about drugs used to treat uh, mental illness and disorders. But for now, uh, we're in uh, this area, and we've moved on from um, sort of legal low-grade stimulants like caffeine and nicotine, and now we're going to talk about psychostimulants. In this particular lecture, we're going to focus on cocaine, and in the next le lecture, we'll focus on the amphetamines. Uh, so what we'll do today is talk first a little bit about the pharmacology of psychostimulants, their primary mechanisms of action, uh, their examples, physiological responses, and side effects, and then we'll get into talking about cocaine specifically. So uh, in terms of how these affect behavior, they do elevate mood, they induce euphoria, they have uh, the ability to increase our alertness, sometimes to the point of paranoia. They certainly can reduce fatigue, and that's primarily what a lot of amphetamines um, are used for, uh, particularly in the military. Uh, pilots are given go pills, which are uh, to increase our energy and decrease our appetite. And part of that has to do with the sympathomimetic actions. They can improve task performance, primarily for well-learned tasks. Um, at some point, the uh, euphoria, mood, uh, and alertness gets beyond the point at which you can uh, perform tasks. So you're not going to sit down and uh, write a novel while you're using cocaine, for example, but you can do fairly simple things, clean house, uh, things that are well rehearsed. Same thing with amphetamines. Uh, amphetamines can improve performance to a point and then we go beyond that and get into uh, crazy town. And they can relieve boredom, but you know it's probably better to just turn on the TV. Um, <laughs> so the primary mechanisms of action for psychostimulants is they all augment synaptic action, actions of dopamine in different ways. Uh, all are behaviorally reinforcing. They all also have medical uses. So these are primarily schedule 2 narcotics. So, for example, amphetamines are used to treat uh, ADHD. Cocaine is used as a topical numbing agent for sinus surgery, uh, etc. All of these have significant side effects. Uh, they can have toxicities at high levels and consistent levels of use, and certainly are um, prone to patterns of abuse. So, it doesn't matter if we're talking about amphetamines or cocaine, they all have fairly similar mechanisms of action. Now, cocaine is primarily dopaminergic whereas the amphetamines are also going to involve norepinephrine to a great extent, and cocaine does as well. Um, but their primary mechanisms of action are relatively similar. So some examples of uh, amphetamines or of psychostimulants include the amphetamines. So uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but Adderall is a racemic mix of dextro and levoamphetamine. Um, Dexedrine is just simply uh, dexo. Um, uh, dextroamphetamine or D-amphetamine. Uh, methylphenidate is also known as Ritalin. Uh, ephedrine uh, is also available sort of in an herbal form, which is Mahuang, which is ephedra. Um, ephedrine used to be available over the counter, um, as did ephedra, or ephedra, sorry, uh, but both were banned uh, back in the 90s. Uh, cocaine, which has been illegal since the uh, early part of the 20th century, and then cathinones, uh, including Cot, Scott, and Mira. The physiological responses of psychostimulants uh, are that they are all sympathomimetic. Uh, they induce a fight or flight slash fright response. And this is one of the major side effects uh, of these drugs. They increase, increase blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, they cause pupil dilation alter blood flow to the muscles, so more blood flows to the muscles, but less blood is allowed to go towards your internal organs. So when you're engaged in a sympathetic nervous system response for long periods of time, your <clears throat> muscles can get, or your internal muscles can, internal muscles, internal organs can suffer. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can uh, end up with organ failure. They also increase oxygen and glucose utilization. And these overwhelm our normal alerting or activating responses and keep us in a high level of alert for much longer than we're supposed to be. So that increased heart rate and blood pressure uh, can uh, be potentially scarring to the heart. 
And that taking blood flow away from internal organs to the muscles uh, can be <clears throat> particularly damaging. And this is one of the reasons why individuals who use methamphetamine for long periods of time often lose their teeth because their, their gums retract because they're not getting the level of blood they need. Side effects of psychostimulants include uh, anxiety, insomnia, irritability, and potentially psychotic behavior, particularly over long periods of time. And oftentimes the psychotic behavior comes from sleep deprivation. So three or four days without sleep, people really get um, pretty Looney Tunes and will start picking their skin uh, and they'll start doing all sorts of crazy things. And so that's oftentimes one of those side effects. That then gets us to cocaine. We'll start with a quick run through the history of cocaine. Uh, like cocaine's used by several civilizations in South America, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, parts of Argentina was primarily used to reduce hunger and increase energy by chewing on the coca leaves. Um, Spanish conquerors first tried to ban this, but then being the uh, colonizers that they were, realized that they could get more work out of their native slaves. And so uh, they kept uh, this particular plant and allowed uh, their uh, native folks to continue using them. In the modern era, there wasn't really much interest until it was isolated uh, and we were able to formulate coca um, cocaine hydrochloride, which is what most cocaine is now. Discovered by Sigmund Freud, uh, he talked about uber cocaine. Um, he talked about what a wonderful drug it was, and this is his uh, sort of song of praise for this magical substance. Later on, he turned his back on cocaine, but he was a heavy cocaine user. Uh, in fact, a lot of people uh, of this era were, including Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote uh, The Cane's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was about cocaine use. And Sherlock Holmes' keen power of observation was uh, thought to be due to his 7% solution of cocaine and his persistent belief that he was being pursued by Professor Moriarty resemble very much the system, symptoms of cocaine paranoia. And so we can see in literature um, how this particular drug has had a significant effect on our culture from Sigmund Freud and his belief, for example, that a uh, sense of smell was an infantile scent, sense because he had no sense of smell, um, due in uh, no, no small amount uh, to his cocaine use. Uh, and then you can see it in our literature as well. Cocaine was praised by Thomas Edison, the Tsar Nicholas of Russia, Prince of Wales in those days, Jules Verne, even the Pope. Coca-Cola, uh, Coca of course, originally had uh, cocaine in it, 60 milligrams for every eight serving. That's where the coca and cocaine comes from, or, or Coca-Cola comes from, is from cocaine. U.S. doctors thought it might be an antidote to alcohol and opiate addiction simply because it had the opposite effects. Um, we'll talk about this in a bit, but treating alcoholism with uh, cocaine is uh, a particularly bad idea. Uh, so cocaine was included in the opiates, along with opiates, in the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 that banned its use and drove it really underground until the 1960s when its use sort of lost its underground. So by the 1920s, cocaine was underground and limited to the sort of cultural avant-garde. Remember, this is the jazz era, um, speakeasies, etc. So its illegal status made it sort of expensive and glamorous. Um, its use decreased and was then replaced with amphetamine. And what we'll see over time is drugs sort of cycle in and out of fashion. And so, for example, in the 1980s, cocaine was wildly popular. Then in the 90s, it was methamphetamine, uh, particularly early 2000s. And then now we're at the point where cocaine is back uh, in vogue. And we're seeing an increase in cocaine overdose, as we saw in earlier lectures. So the use of cocaine uh, is pretty much always determined by price and availability. And price is determined by availability. And so if you look at the retail price of a gram of cocaine. Uh, in the United States, we're sort of at the median here at about $100 a gram. Um, in Brazil, uh, we're looking at you know $10 a gram, whereas in New Zealand, uh, $714 a gram. This was in 2005, but I checked and this isn't too far off. Uh, today, a methamphetamine is often more available. People oftentimes prefer methamphetamine. It has much longer half metabolic half-life. And so it doesn't need to be consumed as often. But because we've had a strict focus on methamphetamine in law enforcement and other arenas, this has now led to a rise in cocaine use. And really, the popularity of drugs simply come and go 
with the times. Uh, he thinks this is just as fashionable as anything else in terms of what uh, drugs people do. So if we look at uh, cocaine price by country, and this was from 2015. Um, prices dropped in New Zealand uh, to about $200 uh, a gram. What's interesting about this um, graph is they've broken it up by sort of normal, what we call street cocaine, and then luxury cocaine, which is usually available from select dealers at a higher price. And again, in the U.S., uh, we see um, the price is, this is in euros. So again, close to about $100 a gram for luxury cocaine, about $80 a gram for standard cocaine. Uh, and again, once again, it's very cheap in Brazil. What's interesting is that cocaine has gotten much cheaper over the years, despite spending hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in a war on drugs. The price in 1981, um, if you bought uh, three quarters of a gram, uh, it was close to $600. Um, sorry, if you were uh, buying less than two grams, uh, a gram was $600. In 2003, that was down to $100. It's really remained at about $100 uh, since the early 2000s. Uh, if you buy higher amounts, you know, it's cheaper. Um, much like anything else. Uh, you can't really go to Costco and buy cocaine, but um, when you buy in bulk, uh, the per gram cost is cheaper. There's also regional variations in the cost within the United States. Um, I think Washington, D.C. or Atlanta were the highest prices in this particular survey. Um, but again, really not terribly different uh, across the United States, hovering right around that $100 point. Also, the purity of cocaine has increased over years. It's kind of come and gone. Um, in the late 1980s, it was very high purity, um, but still relatively pure in the early 2000s at about 60 to 70 percent. Whereas in 1981, we're talking about more like 40 percent street cocaine. So, cocaine use uh, is characterized, or its um, effects are characterized by three different actions. First, it's a local anesthetic. And in fact, that's its clinical use is to numb um, the mucosal membranes in the nose for things like sinus surgery. In fact, uh, cocaine users often talk about how their face feels numb, their gums feel numb, etc. It's also a vasoconstrictor, so one of the effects of cocaine is it shrinks uh, blood vessels, which makes it actually harder to do cocaine. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the uh, blood vessels in the um, sinus passages will constrict. Uh, because of use, and so uh, subsequent use becomes a little bit more difficult. But it's also, of course, a psychostimulant, which is why most people do it. So powder cocaine is cocaine hydrochloride. It's water-soluble and is a less potent form <clears throat> than other forms, um, but that's the reason why it can be um, snorted, is because it is water-soluble. A typical dose is 50 to 100 milligrams at a time, so um, Tenth uh, to uh, what a twentieth of a gram. It can be um, converted into free base or crack. This is its smoked form, uh, which is about two hundred and fifty milligrams to a gram. Um, we'll talk about uh, how cocaine can be combined with um, baking um, powder, baking soda, and um, that's how it's generally smoked. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So uh, that gets us to routes of administration and absorption. Uh, it can be absorbed through any tissue, uh, primarily intranasally. There are people who put it uh, in their eyes, which I don't recommend, um, and also apply it to their gums. Absorption is about 20 to 30 percent due to that vasoconstriction, then that dose continues to be absorbed. Um, oftentimes it's then swallowed. Plasma levels will peak uh, within about 30 to 60 minutes, so relatively quickly. That high is prolonged due to that continued absorption through the mucosal membranes. If it's smoked as bakes, so mixed with baking soda and water, the onset is within seconds because then it's inhaled. That peaks in five minutes and then lasts approximately 30 minutes. So this is uh, when people um, mix cocaine with uh, baking soda and water and then smoke it either with a pipe or on aluminum foil. There are a variety of different ways in which that's done. <clears throat> if it's injected, it's about a 30 to 60 second onset. And in fact, injection is uh, far more likely to lead to addiction than uh, intranasal uh, introduction because the uh, dose levels aren't as high and um, 
it takes longer to absorb. And so it's sort of a longer uh, process where that injection is an instant, very uh, substantial high. So uh, as it gets distributed, it penetrates the brain rapidly. The initial brain concentrations might actually exceed plasma concentrations because it arrives at the brain so quickly. Freely crosses the placental barrier, so this is a drug that's going to affect a fetus and can lead to heart problems, et cetera. So certainly not something that should be done uh, while pregnant. In terms of its metabolism and excretion, uh, the plasma half-life here is pretty short. It's only about 50 minutes. Um, we'll see with uh, amphetamine, it's about 10 to 12 hours. So that's the biggest difference between these drugs is their elimination half-life. It's rapidly moved, removed from plaza, but takes longer uh, to be removed from the brain. It's detectable in urine for about 12 hours. Its metabolite is detectable for about 48 hours, uh, but it is actually longer in chronic users. So uh, that's something to be mindful of. Importantly, in the presence of alcohol, cocaine becomes uh, a whole different drug. So an active metabolite is created when consumed with alcohol. And this is one of the reasons why cocaine use and alcohol use um, go sort of hand in hand. You generally don't see somebody doing one, don't doing cocaine without um, also uh, drinking alcohol. So what happens is uh, there is a metabolite called cocaethylene. It's an active metabolite of cocaine. It's produced in the liver when you combine cocaine and ethyl alcohol use together. So people who are intoxicated with alcohol will create a more potent version of cocaine. So it is as active and we believe more active uh, as an indirect dopamine agonist than uh, the cocaine itself is. So alcohol has a number of effects when combined with cocaine use. It increases blood cocaine levels by inhibiting the metabolism of cocaine because the liver is busy processing out your liquor. Uh, it also results in the production of cocaethylene, this more potent version of cocaine. That also then increases cocaethylene levels by inhibiting its metabolic hepatic metabolism. So that cocaine and cocaethylene both last longer in your system because it's combined uh, with alcohol. And the cocaethylene has a longer half-life, about two and a half hours, uh, and is potentially more toxic than cocaine. And so the two used together uh, result in uh, a very different uh, experience, but also a potentially more toxic experience. So, uh, as I said earlier, a potent uh, cocaine is a potent local anesthetic, and that's still why it's why it's used uh, in medical settings and why it's a Schedule II narcotic and not a Schedule I narcotic. It's a potent vasoconstrictor. It strongly restricts blood blood levels uh, and uh, raises blood pressure. So it restricts those blood vessels and raises your blood pressure. It's a powerful psychostimulant with very strong reinforcing qualities. It potentiates the actions of dopamine by blocking the dopamine transporter. So remember, um, previously we talked about uh, the presynaptic transporter. So it blocks reuptake of dopamine into the presynaptic uh, neuron. And so uh, very dramatically increases the actions of dopamine by blocking that uh, dopamine transporter. It does have some effects on serotonin and potentially some effects on norepinephrine, but its primary effects are in the reinforcing properties of dopamine on that uh, nucleus accumbens. So this is a powerful reward, um, very much more powerful than other types of rewards, and that's one of the reasons why its use uh, is associated uh, with uh, that higher reward. So you can see here, um, cocaine blocks that presynaptic transporter, leaving much more cocaine available uh, in the synapse. <laughs> So the physiological responses that go along with um, cocaine use are it activates the sympathetic nervous system. So pupils will dilate, your bronchi will relax, your heart is going to um, beat faster and stronger. You will not be hungry. It will inhibit activity of your um, digestive tract, and it will constrict the vessels of your internal organs. So you get increased alertness, motor activity, tachycardia, hypertension, bronchodilation, and again, all those things we just talked about. This uh, sympathomimetic response is essentially a long-term stress response. And so uh, this can be potentially dangerous uh, for uh, long-term chronic use. So it's one of the things uh, about cocaine use is limiting uh, use, which not everyone can do. And so it's, it's something to be mindful of as the drug you choose to do. Um, one of the things I don't um, preach about what drug you should or should not use, 
Uh, I simply pro try to provide accurate information for people to make their own decisions. And so I think that's very important. The psychological response is it's a potent dopamine agonist. It's associated with reward and pleasure. It lights up that nucleus accumbens like there's no tomorrow. So you get euphoria, some giddiness, a little maybe enhanced self-consciousness, boastfulness. Um, people become chatty Cathy's. Um, and will talk quite a bit in ways that they wouldn't have before. There's also an increased desire for sex, but that can be a problem because uh, of reduced ability to uh, obtain or maintain an erection. Uh, importantly, at this point, there is a reduced ability to gauge risk. People under the influence of cocaine and other amphetamines will engage in riskier behavior than they would otherwise. And so this is one of the reasons why we see significant risk for um, sexually transmitted infections in those who use uh, these kind of psychostimulants. At increased doses, um, the physiological effects are intensified. Uh, people might get agitated, impulsive, anxious, um, outright paranoid of uh, stories of people who um, clean the peephole in their front door because they're trying to see what's going on outside. And so people can get quite crazy about it. Um, so something, again, to be mindful of. Other effects include what's called formication. This is a sensation of creatures crawling under the skin, and this is generally due to sleep deprivation. So people will pick at their skin to try to find whatever's under the skin. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, methamphetamine users often have uh, scarred faces is because they've been picking at it. Uh, when the acute effects wear off, you can get depression, dysphoria, some anxiety, somnolence, and potentially drug craving. Most people would sleep quite a bit, um, and there is certainly some potential for depression in the days that follow. In terms of tolerance, um, we get increased mood at low doses, certainly produces feelings of euphoria or rush at higher doses, which can be followed by that letdown. Again, the effects of cocaine are briefer than amphetamine, but both show tolerance in a single session. That is, you'll become more tolerant to its use. Your body can prepare for it, um, produce more enzymes to break it down, uh, and it will also downregulate the neurons uh, in the reward pathway. This may reduce fatigue and improve performance or endurance of well-practiced behaviors, uh, but nothing, you're not going to learn anything new. Uh, and certainly, uh, operating a motor vehicle under the influence is a terrible idea. And so... Uh, keep that in mind. Overdose, um, the uh, symptoms are muscle weakness and respiratory depression. A lethality can occur at low doses. Uh, this may be related to sudden increase in brain levels than, rather than the absolute amount, but that's relatively rare. Uh, of course, um, this drug can also cause uh, cardiac arrest, and that doesn't have to be at a toxic level. Um, but at the toxic levels, we get very exaggerated physiological responses, uh, anxious, sleep-deprived, hypervigilant, suspicious, paranoid, altered perceptions of reality, can be aggressive, homicidal, in response to imagined persecution. Um, so again, at high doses, this is, can be a very dangerous drug uh, to both do and to be around those who are doing. So at low doses, um, you know, People can party and have a good time, but at high doses um, over chronic use, it can become very dangerous. So just be cautious and be aware. Uh, an acutely toxic dose of cocaine is about two milligrams per kilogram, which is a gram and a half of cocaine in one dose. Um, and really the only way you're gonna get um, a gram and a half of cocaine in a one-time dose is through injection. So uh, that's a much more dangerous route of administration. You can get serious physiological toxicity the higher dosage you go. And so, again, uh, be mindful. Big problem with cocaine is its cardiac to toxicity. Um, and this can be particularly problematic, uh, particularly over long-term use, because you can get scarring of the pericardium. Also, dopaminergic drugs have been known to cause um, mitral valve defects. So, uh, this is a, a, a potentially dangerous drug to use uh, over the long time. Um, and uh, it can also uh, be associated with seizures, uh, etc.
Sexual effects of cocaine uh, initially may enhance activity. Um, a lot of times people talk about um, the great effects of having sex while on cocaine. Um, continuous use may reduce interest in sex. A big problem for males in particular is uh, a potential inability to obtain an erection, particularly when used in combination with alcohol. So the desire might be there, but the ability might not. Um, we also know that disruptions in the frontal lobes and the reward pathway lead to increased risk taking. And so this is an area in which you can get significant sexual risk taking uh, and potentially um, difficulties with sexually transmitted infections. In terms of pregnancy, uh, this drug causes, crosses the blood brain barrier um, without any difficulty. Early in pregnancy, uh, this can cause spontaneous abortions. Otherwise, can cause low birth rate, abnormalities, neonatal withdrawal, and more sickness during the first year. Later on, you can get cognitive and behavioral difficulties. And then, of course, being the child of a parent who used cocaine uh, during pregnancy, there's great risk for abuse and neglect at that point. Finally, um, in terms of duration of cocaine use and um, the brain, particularly for heavy cocaine use. Uh, if you uh, look at the higher the number of years someone's used cocaine, the greater the reductions in gray matter volume uh, in their brain. So common comorbidities with cocaine abuse, um, a lot of anxiety disorders and clinical depression, a lot of self-medication of depression with this particular drug, a lot of co-substance abuse, about half of cocaine abusers are treated for alcoholism, and a very dangerous combination of heroin and cocaine can be injected or snorted together, and this is called speedball. Um, that provides a heroin component, combines that euphoria of uh, opiates along with the um, primary effects of dopamine uh, via cocaine, and also a very dangerous thing to do. In terms of cocaine dependence and treatment, uh, long-term heavy use is associated with pretty serious complications, in particular microstrokes, uh, potential organ failure, and cardiovascular risk. At this point, there are really no pharmacological treatments. Uh, Modofinil is seen as possibly a way in which to uh, help with working memory difficulties in individuals who have had, uh, who have used uh, methamphetamine, so it might be useful for uh, cocaine as well. Currently, primary support for withdrawal associated depression and cognitive behavioral therapy, and there is a vaccine in development. And the way that vaccine would work is by developing antibodies that would break down cocaine in the blood. And so that's uh, on the horizon. Well, that's our introduction to cocaine. Again, make your own decisions, but be safe. Uh, and in our next lecture, we'll talk about amphetamines.